Wunderbar. Oh, I see. I'm not looking at my. Here we go. All right. So chemistry 3111 today, I just wanted to do uh, to end off today's lecture with a little introduction to aromaticity. And hopefully there we go. You can see my screen. So arom aromatic compounds. So this chapter is a few things and you already have an idea about aromaticity because you've seen an aromatic ring several times in this class. You've heard me talk about benzene, right, which is an aromatic compound. But in this chapter, you're going to learn that there are many, many, many aromatic compounds besides benzene. And something I want you to know um, is that aromatic, you know, yeah, can it mean fragrant? Yes, I suppose. And I'll talk about that more later on. But when you think about an aromatic compound in organic chemistry, it means something that's very stable. Okay, it's going to be a very, very stable compound. So that's what we're thinking about in this chapter. So aromatic compounds, we also call them arenes sometimes, and that's not uncommonly used. Um, and they include benzene and derivatives of benzene. So if we start to put a methyl group on benzene, we call that toluene. And so you should have this one memorized of methyl benzene is not the name we use. We call that toluene. Um, similarly, if you have two methyl groups, um, we call that a xylene. And I'll talk more about xylenes later on. And the reason why aromatic compounds, um, where the word aromatic comes from, is that yes, the first derivatives of benzene did come from tree resins and things like that. And they probably were fragrant. However, now we know many aromatic compounds that have no odor, many aromatic compounds that smell terrible, okay? And so aromatic, again, just to put this bug in your ear, what we're referring to is rings that are very stable. There's an inherent stability with an aromatic ring. So aromatic rings, if you've ever looked at the structure of prescription drugs or illegal drugs, okay, you'll find that aromatic rings are everywhere in these kinds of compounds. And you might even recognize a few compounds here. Maybe, maybe yes, maybe no. Um, uh, Lipitor, I'm, you know, relatively confident that nobody in the room or nobody online is taking Lipitor, but that's an, a platelet inhibitor. So if you know anybody who has cardiovascular problems, they might have been prescribed Lipitor. Um, Zyprexia, so this is a benzodiazepine, which is in the same class of uh, compounds as things like Ativan and Rivotril. Um, so it's an, or Xanax, it's an anxiolytic. Um, what else, what else is on here? So Prilosec, so this is a, um, uh, you can buy Losec or Omeprazole down at uh, Costco, buy the metric ton, it's used for, um, 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 what would it be, um, gastric reflux disease. And you can see that this compound here, Prevacid, is pretty close in its structure and it's used for the same thing. And Plavix is another platelet inhibitor, and it's got an aromatic ring in it. Just to let you know, I worked for the company that developed Lipitor and Plavix. I worked for them for a number of years. Anyhow, something kind of interesting there. Um, and another place that you would find aromatic compounds would be in the fuels, like coal. Okay, and if you've ever used coal, coal to heat your house or something, you know, it looks like this, just this uh, boring, you know, you know, kind of monochromatic, you know, solid here, but um, coal is made out of a whole variety of aromatic rings, really, that are just fused together. And you can see there's other atoms in here. We have a disulfide here. We have an amide here. But by and large, what do we see mostly is aromatic rings. So that's something that's kind of interesting there. And now we're going to switch gears and get into the nomenclature of benzene derivatives, okay? And so if you just put a substituent on an aromatic ring, uh, that all you have to do is name the substituent and follow it up by the word benzene. There's a few exceptions to that, which we're gonna look at in a second. For example, you'd call this chlorobenzene, nitrobenzene, ethylbenzene, um, but some substituents come with common names and you have to have all of these ones memorized, okay? So we're gonna put here, memorize, memorize, all of these, all right? So if you have methyl benzene, we don't call it that, we call it toluene. We don't call this hydroxy benzene, we call it phenol. We don't call this methoxy benzene, we call it anisole. We don't call this amino benzene, we call it aniline. We don't call this carboxy benzene, we call it benzoic acid. 
we don't call this um, benzene carbaldehyde. We call it benzaldehyde, uh, acetophenone, and then finally, uh, styrene. And if you're wondering, is that related to styrofoam? Yeah, partially. Uh, and we could talk about that later on in the class. Okay, so toluene, phenol, anisole, aniline, benzoic acid, benzaldehyde, acetophenone, and styrene. You need to memorize the names of all of these. There's another one that uh, it doesn't ask you to memorize in our book, but it comes up a lot later on, and it's isopropyl benzene. So isopropyl benzene has a common name, which is cumene. And the only reason I bring that up is it comes up, it seems like Avogadro's number of times in this textbook, okay? So, um, you know, an aromatic ring, um, it can take a while to draw. So we have a shorthand for that, which I'm going to get into in a second. But remember, if you have an aromatic ring as a substituent, then it's called a phenyl, right? You have methyl, ethyl, propyl, isopropyl, butyl, terbutyl, secbutyl, isobutyl, and phenyl. Phenyl is a substituent. Don't mix up phenyl with phenol, right? Those are two different things. A phenyl is an aromatic ring that's considered a substituent. Phenol, right, which we just saw a couple of slides ago, that's an alcohol, phenol, okay? So phenol and phenyl, two very different things. Something that you're never going to see me do is represent an aromatic ring with a phi. Okay, I will never, ever do that. I don't like that. But you'll see me represent it as pH like this all the time. Not to be confused with pH, right? pH is equal to the negative log of the concentration of hydronium. It's lowercase and uppercase. This is uppercase and lowercase, right? It's something completely different. Anyhow, so there you go. Another thing I just noticed in my notes here, sometimes if you're studying for like an MCAT or something, they do this thing where um, for a phenyl, they'll write C6H5 is, is just another way of, of writing it because that's the formula of the phenyl is C6H5. Anyhow, I probably won't use that either. Okay, if you have a dimethyl benzene, we call that a xylene. There's three possibilities. You can have the groups being one, two, like right next to each other. We call that orthoxylene. If they're one, three, with respect to their uh, substitution, we call that metaxylene. And if you have them in the one, four position, or one, four, one and four positions, then we call it paraxylene. So ortho, meta, and paraxylene. All right. And ortho, meta, and para, these prefixes can be used for di substituted benzene rings. Remember, what does di mean? Di. It means two. Two. You, if you have two substituents on a ring, we can use ortho, meta, and para. You can see some examples here. We have ortho nitro anisole, meta bromo toluene, and para chloro uh, benzaldehyde. And so we're going to get some practice on, um, on di substituted benzenes uh, as we move forward. But if you have to name any kind of benzene derivative, First thing you do is you identify the parent, and it's not always benzene, right? It could be anisole, it could be benzaldehyde, et cetera, et cetera. And so remember, remember common names that I asked you to memorize. So common names, those will come up. Um, then you identify name substituents, number the parent chain, give a locant to every substituent. Give the first substituent the lowest number possible. If you're using a common name, then the, com the substituent that's part of the common name, that is assigned number one. And you ignore prefixes except iso, cyclo, and neo, and you list everything in alphabetical order. And that's it, man. That's how you name a uh, benzene derivative. So here our parent would be phenol. And what I said is the substituent that's part of the parent, that's considered to be number one. So you'd have one, two, three, four, five, six. So you'd call this compound. 3,5-dibromophenol, like that, okay? Um, so that's all you'd have to do is list the substituents, nothing more than that. So if we wanted to name a compound like this, well, I think these compounds were named a couple of slides ago. I'll prove it to you. It's the same compounds right here. So I'll kind of move past that. All right, so if we wanted to name these, why don't we come back and name these after um, the Memorial Day break? And the same thing uh, with these ones here. We'll get some practice on drawing those. 
And then um, I just want to mention about the structure of benzene. Okay, scientists knew the formula of benzene, which is C6H6. They had all kinds of different, you know, structures proposed that were incorrect. And some of the proposed structures are really wacky. Um, you know, at least they're wacky nowadays. I have a couple of them drawn in my notes. Like one of them was something like this, where you had two cyclopropanes fused together in a box like this. Another one had, you know, two, you know, two um, rings fused together like this. Another one had something like this. Okay. But none of these were, were correct. There was problems with all of these proposed structures. And K. Coulet had this famous dream <clears throat> where he dreamt of a snake consuming itself by, a ta by its tail. And then he said, well, you know, I think it's actually a, a cyclic compound. And he was right. And uh, yeah, he's the one who proposed the correct structure of benzene, which of course we know exists in these two resonance forms. So remember, it's not like the pi bonds are vibrating around the ring or anything. They're delocalized over the entire molecule. And that's why sometimes people draw benzene like this, right? They'll just say, uh, they'll draw a, a, a six membered ring and they'll say, well, all of those electrons are delocalized. You'll probably never see me draw that. I don't, I don't like that. And the reason I don't use this a whole lot is because when you're teaching the subject, it's not really useful. It's not very useful when you're teaching this to students. You want to stick with either this or this, okay? And you'll see why when we get into mechanisms. I want to show you one more quick thing to kind of whet your appetite for why you have to cover a whole, why a whole chapter on aromatic compounds exists. So check this out. Everybody who's hearing the sound of my voice or watching this video knows this reaction very well from organic chemistry number one. This is a reaction we learned in chapter eight, right? In the alkenes chapter, we said, if you take a double bond, you treat it with bromine, it makes the bromonium ion, it gets attacked by a bromide, and you end up with a trans dibromide, like you see here, right? Anti-addition, okay? And you might think, well, come on, in an aromatic ring, you've got one, two, three double bonds. Hey, man, this should be reactive like crazy. And the answer is no, it's not. You get no reaction whatsoever. So that tells you that the pi bonds in here, there's something making them unreactive. There's something that's making them very unreactive. And if you look at the heat of hydrogenation of cyclohexene, that's this compound here, it releases 100, 120 kilojoules per mole. And so if you put an extra pi bond in it, right, you release about twice as much energy. It's not quite twice as much, but it's close. You go from 120 to 232. So then if you had a theoretical compound, Okay, so this compound, the reason it's drawn in red, and if you're going, well, that's benzene. No, they're imagining a theoretical compound called 1,3,5-cyclohexatrine, which doesn't exist. I agree. Okay, but they'd say, well, if you hydrogenate that, you just go from 120 to 230 and then to around 360, right? Shouldn't you? Well, what happens is when you hydrogenate benzene, you only release 208 kilojoules per mole of energy. So what does that tell you? It tells you that there's this really big stabilization factor with having those three pi bonds in conjugation in that six membered ring. And the way that we explain that stability is by looking at our good friend MO theory. That's right, molecular orbital theory. And so we'll save that for um, uh, the video that I'm going to post. So I'm going to post a video that covers all of this content and then um, uh, the. So all of the content will be covered in the videos that I'm going to post. And then when we come back after Memorial Day, all we'll have to do is some review and some practice, and we'll be good to go uh, from there.